Eric, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, it's it's really cool to have the opportunity to speak to you on on several different fronts. Now, I love the fact that you're going to come to this conversation with lots of different viewpoints because of your work in the hypertrophy world and your work in the strength-based world. Um, and that, I feel, is a very unique point of view to have, which is why I'm very interested to pick your brains over a few things. So, um, I guess kind of starting off, when you're looking at, at, at programming for your, your strength athletes, how much of your hypertrophy work are you bringing across to them and how big a crossover is there between the two good question yeah i think the uh, um the best way to think of it is first we have to look at what is the relationship between these two things like hypertrophy and strength um and probably the best way to understand it is that there's a, a lot of factors that go into strength you know strength is always expressed in in the gym world through a movement you know um so there's not only a skill component, there's also the ability to recruit muscle mass, uh, perform a motor pattern well, uh, you know, in, ingrain your technique and be able to recruit high threshold motor units and fire them in a, in a way that produces a high force output. Uh, one of the many components, in addition to all those, is the actual actin myosin content of the muscle. So how much contractile tissue you have. And there's also other aspects of hypertrophy, which can uh, impact indirectly your, your force production. So the best way to think of it is that muscle size is one of the various factors that contributes to strength. So if you have a strength athlete uh, who may or may not be strong as they want, or rather probably a better way to put it, who wants to get stronger, um, they may have various numbers of these qualities in different amounts. You know. Yeah. Uh, so for example, a beginner is going to be not very good at the movement, not very big, um, and as a result, not very strong. And it doesn't have the full complement of neuromuscular or structural adaptations. Uh, so you would create a training approach that, that achieves all of that, which is really easy for a beginner, just this lifting. Um, once you get to the intermediate stage, when you've made the vast majority of those neuromuscular adaptations, you've got some decent skill. Um, there's still refinement of skill wrong but there may be more of a role for muscle size so this is where you might start to manipulate volume look at doing more accessory movements etc um, and then at the advanced level the way i like to think of an advanced lifter is not necessarily how they compare to others but how they are as far as reaching their own max capacity you know for example andy bolton you know he says the first time he deadlifted he pulled 600 pounds that's an advanced level deadlift but is that does that mean that andy bolton the first time he trained was advanced well, compared to other people, sure, but not for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I think you need to look at – it's crazy, right? You know, So you need to look at uh, where you are relative to your, your potential, uh, which, of course, you can't know, but uh, it's not based on your objective numbers, how long you've been in the gym, how quickly you can progress, et cetera. And um, so that means if you get someone who is advanced, they're going to have, by definition, some individual needs. You might have someone who is just – been training very, very strength orientated, and they might not have as much muscle mass as you might expect for how strong they are. Or likewise, you might have had someone who came from a you know recreational bodybuilding background, has trained for many years very hard, but perhaps has never deadlifted before. You know, uh, so you would have a very different approach for each one of them. And in the case of someone uh, who doesn't have a lot of muscle mass, their quote unquote strength program might look a lot more like a bodybuilding program. You know, while still building some skill on the list they want to get. So that, that's kind of a long answer to your question, but that's kind of the way I like to, 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 to position it so people understand. Yeah, 100%. And I want to try and get kind of uh, even more specific with, with this. So let's talk through uh, kind of uh, the, the three phases there, kind of beginner, intermediate, advance. How sure. much uh, on like a percentile basis would you say that size is having an influence on their progression? So obviously when you're a beginner, you've got so many different things that you're having to go through. Like you said, you're having to learn the skill, which, you know, it takes a second to learn, lifetime to master. I've been squatting for like 13 mm. years. Dude, I still have days where I can't squat. Go figure. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a case of that there's going to be size involved, like you said. It's going to be a case of learning how to fire more muscle fibers, getting that adaptation in the muscle fiber to actually produce more contractile force, like you spoke about through myosin and stuff like that. How much is size having as a contributing factor in that beginner phase, then into the intermediate, and then right at the end of the upper echelon, how much is that having a factor? 
Yeah, so for a beginner, when you look at some of the research on like initial adaptations, um, there is hypertrophy that occurs when you first start lifting weights, um, but how much you can introduce to strength out of the total amount of strength you're gaining as a relative proportion is actually really low. Um, so for example, and, and this is not to say that it's not contributing, it's more so to say that you gain so much strength initially uh, that as a relative factor, it's, it's kind of a minor player. So there was a study in 05 by uh, Hubble and colleagues. This is a classic study that looks at kind of the range of responses. And it's a, it was a 12 week program, I think on bicep curls and leg press, if I recall correctly, and I might have that a little wrong. Uh, but the main finding, the point was that after 12 weeks, they had a response rate for 1RM increases from 0%, meaning in eight weeks, people didn't get any stronger. Um, sucks to be that person on that program. <laughs> yeah, Up to 250%. Happen. It does, yeah, exactly. In one RM, so that's a you know that's an insane increase in in strength. And then on the uh, hypertrophy side of it, in, I believe it was cross sectional area, you saw again a zero to roughly sixty percent change. So even the extreme outlier in hypertrophy was increasing their muscle mass by sixty percent. But that's only that's less than one quarter of the total amount of strength they gained. You know, so you can just see there, just kind of looking at the absolute magnitude in a relative sense that. Uh, those initial neuromuscular adaptations when you're first learning how to do a movement and uh, coordinate intra and intramuscularly, um, there's so much to be gained. You know, like I remember trying to think back to the first few times I lifted. It's been a while, but I would just ask any of the audience who's been lifting for a while to think back to me in the first like six weeks they trained you started doubling your, your strength over that time period. Uh, maybe not the raw 1RM, but like the number of things you could do for 10 reps. You know, it wasn't that long before I was going from squatting say 135 pounds for 10 to 225 pounds for 10. That would have happened within the first three months probably, you know? Um, so I think for people to understand that while they may have seen a doubling in the number of reps they could do with a given load or uh, the load they can do at a given number of reps, they didn't see a double increase in their, in their muscle size, you know? Um, so early on at the initial stages, you're going to rapidly gain strength. And I would say maybe after the first three to six months, that's when muscle size starts to contribute a lot more. And that's backed up by the research. And then at the very advanced level, or the more advanced you get, I should say, it's kind of a sliding scale. It becomes more important. Um, but this is tough to tease out because while we can finally measure strength, like, you know, we, we can measure Newtons on a force plate or we can uh, have calibrated plates to, to one kilogram, um, measuring ch changes in muscle size is an inherently messier measurement. You know, if we're looking at a DEXA, this is actually a relatively... Uh, is a global measurement. We're looking at lean body mass. Uh, it's not a direct measure of hypertrophy. You can do muscle thick ultrasound. You can do MRI, but those are a lot more difficult to do. Um, and when you're thinking about something like a compound lift, there's a ton of things that are contributing, a lot of different muscle groups that are contributing. So what do you measure? Do you measure just the prime mover? So it's actually quite difficult to assess small changes in muscle size, and that's all you're going to get at a very, very advanced level. Uh, there was a study, there's a couple of studies, there's one by Appleby, I think, uh, looking at professional rugby union players over two years, and there's another one that was done afterwards, I think it was over five years. And uh, when you measure over that time period, yeah, you can see these changes in, uh, in, in advanced level lifters, uh, that they are actually adding some size. Uh, but there's another study on, um, I want to say, nationally qualified uh, enhanced bodybuilders over six months, and they're looking at their their bicep curl and their change in, in, in um, bicep muscle thickness. And these are enhanced bodybuilders. So they're doing everything they can to get bigger, taking anabolic steroids. And over six months, there was no change measurable in muscle size. Wow. Um, wow. So, I mean, if you think about it, That's you know, crazy. once you're, once you're at the, yeah, I mean, cause you've been lifting for 15 years and you're, you're, you're huge. I mean, you, you don't even see at the Olympia level, people gaining more than five, 10 pounds, you know, from year to year. And sometimes that has much more to do with what they maintain uh, and get on stage with. So, yeah. So gaining muscle at the advanced level is a very, very slow process. And we don't have multi-year long studies. You know, we have it a long study of six months, you know, so it's quite rare to have those uh, rugby studies I, I mentioned, but it does happen. So the, but it's, it's much easier to see changes in strength. You know, like if you look at um, IPF, like world-class performers, like a Give an example. Uh, my my friend and my athlete uh, Bryce Lewis, you know, he's he saw kind of a steady increase in his total, going from you know like 875 to 890 to like 907, you know, or 905, 902 in that range. So like, yeah, when you're when you're measuring a single kilo or five kilos out of a total of 900, those are really small changes. 
only gaining two and a half to seven and a half kilos on three lifts, but you can see that there is strength progression over years. Uh, and that's much easier to measure because it's a larger total number than it is muscle mass. So while I do think that muscle size contributes a lot more to your total strength, once you've really ingrained your motor patterns and you're not making these large scale neuromuscular adaptations, uh, it's difficult to, to say, yeah, it's all about hypertrophy because there's so little gain happening overall in the first place. Mm. So it's kind of like you're dealing with a smaller and smaller pie, even though the percentage of that pie becomes a greater amount of hypertrophy. It's hard to see that in the literature. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. And um, I mean, it's it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because when you get to those upper echelons, it's it's not a case of that there's one person that's kind of standing on the platform that's that much smaller than everyone else. Everyone tends to be very very similar size very very similar builds because they understand that they need to have those areas built up to stabilize these crazy weights that they're lifting you know what i mean and like you said the progression is so so small over so many years so <clears throat> when when you're looking at that progression obviously with the the pro guys it's so so small in the early stages your your progression is tremendous how mm. uh, how much and how long do you need to spend on working on those motor patterns and learning how to fire those motor patterns before you're really going to be getting to that advanced level? You know, there's this whole like 10,000 hours that gets thrown around, mm. but I, I'm always very interested to hear from someone that comes from science. What have you seen and what are the, the progressions and scales that people are kind of progressing into? How fast is it taking until they get to that point? Yeah, that's a good question. And it typically comes and starts in spurts when you kind of quote unquote figure things out. And it also depends on the, the skill of the lift. So like an interesting thing you'll see in, if you look at some of the IPF records, like the juniors, do really, really well and compare quite well with the open lifters. But the one lift that they tend to lag behind on is bench press. Uh, and there's maybe two things you, you could you could take from that. And this is just anecdotal. because This isn't like a randomized controlled trial. Um, the bench press is probably a little more dependent on muscle mass and de developing upper body muscle mass. And that might take longer. Um, so that tells you something there. As well as there's some data showing, actually from way back in the day, that there is a distinctly different motor pattern in highly advanced bench pressers compared to uh, moderately advanced bench pressers. Uh, a bit of the, the quote unquote J curve that you'll hear about where the bar, when it initially leaves the chest, it travels back and then up um, instead of up and then back. And that's a slightly different motor pattern. And that actually get, puts you in a slightly better position to kind of game the system of the biomechanics of the bench press to lift the most. Um, and you see that in a really advanced bench pressers, but not in novices. So that may be a technique that takes more time to develop, and it also make more takes more time to develop uh, the muscle mass on bench press to be able to, to throw up a lot of weight. Um, another kind of reason I'm uh, correlating that is uh, it's like if you look at some of the enhanced lifters records versus the IPF, you typically see a greater disparity between bench presses than you do squats and deadlifts. So it may be that the the muscle mass component is that has the biggest player in the bench press. You know, it's a of motion the most restricted it's the least full body of the lifts so you can make an argument that it might be the most like just how juicy are your your pecs and delts dependent uh, lift you know so yeah, how thick can you make them and, and how uh, how small can you make that range of motion you know how how thick is your exactly. ribcage you know? genetically how far does it sit away from your spine like how how far are you actually having to press it it's uh it's definitely a different lift to, to the to the deadlift and the and the squat 100 percent. so <clears throat> How often are you recommending that people work on the, the these motor patterns through the various stages uh, of progression? And the reason I say so is like you look at uh, an advanced group of lifters like the guys over at Westside, a lot of the guys that use a conjugate method. Um, <clears throat> and I've heard you talk about this previously on other podcasts that they're using such a wide variety of uh, of the lifts. Now, you do make a great point of saying, but at the core value, it is still a squat bench and deadlift. But, you know, they're, they're doing it with yeah. every single bar, every single attachment, every single uh, way to load the muscle that you possibly can. How necessary is that in the grand scheme of things? Like, And is it taking away from you just working through the raw motor pattern, which you should be doing? 
Yeah, I think this is, um, it's, you know, there, I just wrote a recent uh, a blog post for, uh, for 3DMJ and there was, the title was success leaves clues, but what clues does it leave? And I think it's a really understandable, normal, and to some degree, even a logical thing to do to look at who has been highly successful in your sport or your vocation and what have they done? Um, but I think the, the mistake that some people make is they think the saying success leaves clues is actually saying success leaves answers, but it doesn't. The only thing we know from someone who has been successful is that what they're doing hasn't prevented success. We can't know that it is everything that they've done has led to high-level success, right? So that's an important distinction. And what we can do is we can look at uh, uh, paradigms of training or nutrition or thought that seem to be counter to one another that have both resulted in high-level success. And then you can start eliminating variables. So for example, um, Shaiko has also produced a tremendous number of very high-level powerlifters. There's also a lot of powerlifters who came from a conjugate background. So we can tell in either case, the amount of variation that occurs in those two systems is not a game breaker. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a deal breaker. It's not the thing that's going to make or break you. You know, Shaiko basically has, you know, two variations. You know, there's the, the deadlift with the pause and then the, the deadlift from blocks. And then pretty much everything else is competition bench, competition squat, competition deadlift. Um, and they train mostly with, uh, you know, it, with, with a fair number of reps in reserve. While, on the other hand, conjugate, uh, you are training the main lifts less frequently. Uh, and when you do train the main lifts, they're typically a variation, like you said. Uh, and on top of that, uh, once a week on each lift, you're going to a damn near max. Um, and typically, it's either the squat or the deadlift when that's occurring, if you look at kind of the way it used to be programmed. So it does seem that if those both if both of those systems have produced really, really high-level lifters, we know that none of those are absolute game breakers, you know. Um, so what do we see? We don't see any power lifters who go, you know, a full mesocycle without training some variation of squat, bench, or deadlift, right? So we know that there needs to be some level of maintaining your your sport performance uh, to, to to be to be successful. Uh, we can also look at so, for example, the the Russian system typically involves a lot of lift variations, a lot of pulls from hangs, from blocks. Um, from different positions, uh, breaking down the lift into various movements, sub-maximal training. And then you can look at the Bulgarian system, uh, where it's almost all classic lifts, pretty much just squat, front squat, snatch, and clean and jerk. And they have both produced very high-level lifters. There are costs to those. You know, the Bulgarian system is also chewed up and spit out more lifters. Uh, the Russian system requires a national sporting system with people trained to coach in a certain way, being brought up from a young age and having kind of a homogenous uh, system, which comes out of a very, at the time they were very successful, comes from a homogenous society. Um, you know, if you think of that, that kind of Eastern Bloc mentality that came out of the USSR. So some of these things are not necessarily replicable, nor are they things that we should try to emulate. Um, you know, we're not seeing success in the Western Olympic weightlifting until now that CrossFit's been around for more than a decade, because now we have people who started Olympic lifting as a teenager and are now in their 20s when they're peaking, uh, and now they're competitive at a high level. So we're just, just seeing that, hey, it's a completely different system, but it does have a low, uh, you know, a young age where you enter and a lot of time accumulated. So it does take a long time to become highly advanced in, say, the Olympic lifts because they're much more skilled. Uh, the power lifts, they don't take nearly as much time. Uh, that might, now we might see that the age where people peak in powerlifting starts to get younger as the sport participation increases. But there was a recent study that came out where the mean age in powerlifters, when they peaked in terms of their performance, this doesn't mean they got weaker after that or that you can't get stronger after this point, but the mean age where people you know, reached their, their highest level of improvement was about 34 in powerlifting, and I think it was about 27 in Olympic weightlifting. So I, I think that age of 34 will come down a little bit as the uh, the total number of people participating in powerlifting increases. But in Olympic weightlifting, where there's a lot more participation, uh, it is younger. But some of that has to just do with the components of power. Uh, you know, you start getting slower earlier than you start getting uh, uh, worse at force production. And you can so, also argue to answer your question, it's going to be a little bit um, of the like mobility as well, because obviously with with Olympic lifts, you know, the mm -hmm. range of motion required at the ankle, at the hips, and at the knees, it's it's 
so much more extreme than kind of your just just parallel squatters it's uh, it demands something very different 100 percent. no 100 percent. yeah that you're, to- you're totally right there's a, there's a number of components uh related to the physiological necessities of olympic lifting that will probably be hindered more so by age than you will see in powerlifting um so to, so to bring it full circle to answer your question i think the best way to envision being a novice is whether you can progress pretty much every time you try to uh, each time you step in the gym to to move up your squat your bench, your deadlift, your snatch, or your, your, your clean and jerk, you could lift more. Uh, intermediate, this might happen more like mesocycle to mesocycle. And an advanced lifter, you might have to review multiple blocks or even a full macro cycle, a year, a season. You know, you're comparing nationals to nationals or worlds to worlds before you can actually assess whether or not you're getting stronger. And I think that is, with the assumption that you're doing things right, that's probably the best way to conceptualize whether you're novice, advanced, or, or intermediate is how quickly you, can you progress? And to play uh, devil's advocate here, out <clears throat> strength. how would yeah, you confirm that? How would you confirm that that was right? How do you know? <laughs> oh, you pretty much can't. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, exactly. you can't. You know? Yeah, welcome this, this to is, the sport. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the best thing you, you can do is you you can assess, like, all, of all the things we know. Like, that. that's basically what... Uh, what science and observation can tell us is kind of what we're the ballpark of reasonableness. So like, like we said, we, we know that there are no successful power lifters who go full mesocycles without squatting, benching or deadlifting. Right? So if you're someone who is not getting stronger and you for the last four weeks have not squatted, benched or deadlift, maybe that's something to attend to that kind of thing, you know? Um, and we typically see that there are no successful power lifters or Olympic lifters who only train high rep, low load. So if you're someone who's only training light for high reps, that's probably not a good idea either. So, I mean, those are pretty broad factors and we could get more narrow than that. You know, we, we could look at frequency, volume, and intensity for, for, for strength and kind of meta analytic data and combine that with what probably makes sense theoretically and then also observationally what we see. And that's when you can start to really narrow it to what we think, hey, here's what a program should look, look like for the the quote unquote average lifter who doesn't exist. And then from there, it's all, you know, a case study of one trial and error. Um, maybe get a coach if you're not good at, at, at kind of assessing yourself. And, and then if you're, you know, you're plateaued and you've gained a lot of muscle, you've gained a lot of strength and things start slowing down, you can probably reasonably guess that you're not leaving something on the table. Um, but a lot of the times when someone approaches me as a coach, they do have a blind spot. You know, they have been holding themselves back in a lower weight class for years, trying to stay lean for the gram. Or they have only lifted heavy and they've been uber, uber specific, or they've been on the other side. You know, they, they, they spent all their time uh, under a certain number of assumptions. Like they've never tried doing a main lift more than twice per week, or they will only, you know, deadlift once every mesocycle or something like that because of, you know, Louis Simmons or something like that. Um, and... You know, so so if someone is stuck in a certain paradigm of thinking, or if they have a blind spot that's prevented one of the major pillars of what helps you gain strength, you know, calorie surplus, good sleep, that's another really common one, people's lifestyle, they just don't have a conducive environment to to, to being a strength farmer, you know, like they need more sun, sunshine or, 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 or water for their gains, being like, you know, sleep, food, stress management, uh, something like that, uh, or they have like an abysmally low protein intake, you know, maybe they, they, they have been eating in a way that they don't realize is pretty shitty. So uh, there's there's all those little things you can shore up that are outside of the gym, and then there's paradigm problems with, with being in the gym. And if you fix all of those, uh, and the person is not even able to gain strength, you can probably assume that they are close to the, the some kind of, not necessarily a plateau, but in a, a diminishing returns phase of their, of, of their the lifting career, unfortunately. So... Yeah, so it's. I want to bring it back to the point that, that you made earlier because, I mean, well, <clears throat> you're kind of like known as this guy, but talking about the training multiple times per week, I want to pick mm. your brains about that from a strength perspective. Now, this is a very interesting, very interesting point because from the, like the strength world, it's a case of the a lot of programs is you're going to train that, you're going to train it until it's done. And then it's going to be so fucking burnt out for the rest of the week that you're not going to be able to utilize that as well as you should be able to until it comes back around to the next week. And I've had training programs like that before and you end up feeling 
hella beaten up and then when you change programs and you start doing things multiple times per week you're like oh like i can actually work and i can move and i feel good and i'm getting stronger and it's a very interesting concept how much do you think that that can carry over into strength and what do you think is the kind of glass ceiling where you're like well you're not actually able to load it enough that many times per week before you kind of get any more benefit from it Mm -hmm. i like the way you framed that and i think um i think it's really important to remember that we like i think the the way we talk about what we respond to and individual differences is almost like we have this fixed individual profile and like if we could just unlock what that is we'd be able to find the perfect program for us but the reality is is that our individual profile changes over time as well and this is kind of the whole concept of periodization and uh you know what, what mike stone and what mike is were telling some of the folks at rp have described as phase potentiation which is essentially saying that the training you have done previously is going to dictate what might be optimal for you today uh so for example um, Shiko, we'll go back to that example. Primarily, you're training with a very high number of RIR, so a lot of reps in reserve, uh, and you're doing singles, doubles, triples, fours, and sometimes fives, typically training in the 65 to 80% of 1RM range. Um, and you're doing a lot of volume, and you're doing the, the lifts multiple times per week, and that uh, frequency increases as you become more quote unquote advanced. Um, this system capitalizes on motor pattern development. Uh, and being able to really ingrain these patterns in the face of fatigue. And I find they are really, really good for people uh, who the bottleneck to their performance improving is skill development. However, if you give this to someone who has been doing a lot of that already and is very highly developed with the skill, but is simply small, uh, it's it's not going to be that successful. And what their bottleneck, their biggest low-hanging fruit, if you will, might be actually pushing to a higher RPE, so fewer reps in reserve, doing more accessory work, and simply building up their engine while maintaining uh, those those motor patterns. So, excuse me. So, for example, if you talk to some of the people who have these mind-blowing games when they, gains when they go to a new system, and remember this happened to me. I went from Max OT, which for those who don't know, this is kind of an old-school program. It's a lot of bodybuilding training in the four to six rep range to failure with low volume and a moderate frequency. I came to that after doing Shiko, and then I did something similar to that afterwards, and both times it worked amazingly well. And I thought, oh, I must be a high volume guy. Oh no, I must be a low volume guy. And the reality was that at that time, that's what set me up for success. I had maxed out uh, the amount of short-term skill development I can get from Shiko. And then when I started going to uh, higher RPE training and doing more accessory movement and more bodybuilding stuff, uh, I was able to, to then have those two different components of strength peak and I hit some PRs. Um, so I think that that's probably the best way to look at it is that if you are someone who's been, like you said, doing you know the, the, the training style where you go in and you train deadlift until you can barely move, you go in and train bench until it hurts to brush your teeth, you go in and train squats until your hips hate you, and then you do it again the next week and then you eventually deload when you can barely move, and you go to something that is a higher frequency, lower volume per session, lower RPE per set, you're probably going to find that it actually works really well because your fatigue dissipates. You're not trying to, you know, train these motor patterns in a really beat up state. You're not trying to condense all your motor learning into one three hour session. And now you can actually capitalize on a different avenue to strength. And then once that stops working, then you can find something uh, that, that goes well with that. And I think that's why typically you see better results when you do something like volume followed by intensity, followed by peaking, you know, your kind of standard, you know, block or Western model. Um, and all of the tweaks of periodization to that basic concept still keep it. So even like your daily undulating program where you might have, have multiple different types of adaptations trained in the same week, they're still linear. You will have, you know, let, let's say your, your volume block is more sets, lower RPE, and you might be doing sets of eight, six, and four, but you still got the sets of four. And then when you go to your intensity block, there's fewer sets, higher RPE, and you might be doing five, three, one. So, you know, four is still less than five and almost the same as three. So the transition between those phases is a little smoother and you retain more of the previous adaptations uh, when you when you use that kind of undulating model or when you truncate the, the Western model into block periodizations. So you're looking at, you know, three to six week long mesocycles. So they're all just 
modifications to that same concept of, hey, what you attained previously in your mesocycle of training uh, maybe should lead into what you're going to do now. And that's not always the case, but that tends to be a general finding. Like, again, like if we th think about, about success leaves clues, what do a lot of people, even the conjugate method, um, if you look at what a lot of them are doing, it still has linearity to it. You know, uh, for example, you, I've seen some mesocycles of West side setup where you do, you know, a single at 90%. A single at close to your previous PR, and the next week you try to set a PR, and you do a little bit less volume on your other movements, deload, rinse, and repeat. That's linear, you know, even though it's quote unquote conjugate, and you might be swapping to a new version of, of the main lift in the next four week meso cycle. So I think so long as people understand that some kind of linearity is important, uh, that the training the main lifts with some semi regularity is important, and then assessing what is your bottleneck to strength. And that that's maybe the quality you should focus on most of the time until it's no longer your bottleneck. Then then you can kind of navigate some of these issues instead of looking at it as like, is Shaiko better than West Side or is you know, frequency better than him or is intensity better than that? You know, it's more like what's the best tool for my specific situation. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's so funny because I feel like pretty much. 90% of the videos on YouTube, like 90% of the podcasts that are out there in the fitness world, it's just basically the answer to every question is, it depends. It's personal. It's all dependent mm. upon what that person requires at that given time. That, and, that, and at the end of the day, you you can do nothing to know what that is. So it's, uh, I love the way that you've, that you've kind of phrased things there that... <clears throat> I want to play devil's advocate for a second here and kind of say, so let's look at the guys at the top level, the guys that have come from the various different backgrounds at their true muscle potential. You could take a guy that has done conjugate method for their entire life. You could take it over to some Eastern block training from a true muscle potential standpoint. In theory, those guys would be able to do exactly what those guys are because when they step on stage, they're putting up a thousand pound total. They're putting up a thousand pound total. They are the different contributing factors are obviously, yeah, there's going to be different frequency. There's going to be different load. It's going to be different volume. You might have more guys that get beaten up through this model, through this model, through this model. But at the end of the day, from a true muscle potential standpoint, surely they are all capable of doing the exact same thing. Yeah, I think also we, um, a lot of the time, is the anecdotes we have and the big picture generaliz generalizations we use, um, they fall apart once we actually start to look at what do those individuals really do. Uh, you know, so for, for example, uh, Shiko 32, I believe back in the day, might have been either the peaking one or the intermediate one, uh, when Shiko actually came out and worked with Omar Isaf and Mike is until did some translations, come to find out that was like a random training block for, I think, a junior female that somehow got interpreted as it came to the English, the, the English speaking world <laughs> as, oh, this is the intermediate one. It's completely false, you know? Um, and the general perception that the, the Shanko system is you never go, go, go high intensity or you don't push near failure. Um, there's many examples where Shiko would actually have an athlete do that if that's what they needed. Um, so these, these kind of when we, when we play telephone with, with these systems, uh, we start to make generalizations that might be true for these the stock standard uh, intermediate, but they end up falling apart when you look at the individual needs on the advanced level. So, for example, uh, there's a saying that the only people who are actually training West Side were the people who are at West Side Barbell. Uh, and uh, if you've talked to people who have interned with Louis Simmons or been in there, uh, they will tell you, and I've heard this multiple times from different people who I've known who've done that, uh, that what is actually put forth from kind of the West Side conjugate community and what actually occurs in some cases is quite different. Um, and it is much more individual. And I think the answer of it depends is true, but it's often a, a cop out uh, uh, that I find we don't really know how to make improvements say. When I say it depends, I normally, unless I'm like in, in a, like a short form uh, uh, media platform, I'm going to tell you what it depends on, why, when, how. Uh, my goal with, with the statement of it depends is to arm the person with understanding what time points for who, at what stage in your career, in the context of your life, do, do things depend on. So if someone says it depends, you nod your head and go, well, of course, that's the way it works. What does it depend on? How in my situation should I, should I adapt that? 
Now, the problem is it's on, on both ends. Sometimes I'll get questions where the underlying assumption is not that it does depend. It's like, hey, so should I do three by five or five by five? That 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 question, it makes it makes me think that that person thinks that there's some universal training program, um, which is a, a stage of learning. You know, like you need to get to the point where you can actually ask useful useful questions so that I can give you useful answers. So if someone asks me that question, I'm not even left with being able to tell them what it depends on. I go, I can go, it depends. Really, there's, I can tell them that's not a useful question. That's probably the most useful answer I can give them is that's not the way you should be thinking about this. Yeah. Um, and that that's typically what I do it, when, when someone asks a question that makes me realize they're not even able to ask useful questions. Then I try to go, hey, I really want you to think about this differently. There is not a universal answer to that or everyone would be training the same. Um, so let's start thinking about what you need and here's some resources I would advise you to, to, to look at. Come back to me in a year is almost the, the, the proper answer. Um, and then once you, you've got people who, and you, can, you can see this in someone who starts being a personal trainer in the first three months versus a year later, they just have this completely different, if they're paying attention, doing a good job, they have this realization of, oh my God, like, you know, trying to train every, everyone like me, uh, A, didn't work, and B, I'm actually not as far as I thought I was. And now I've worked with some people who are completely different than me or way more advanced than me and who need totally different things. And once you've been in the trenches for a while, you start to realize, uh, you know, that you need to have specific solutions to specific problems. And the value of experience, if you're paying attention, is that you've gone through that problem-solving process so many times that you start to see patterns. Um, and someone who's worked with a thousand athletes versus someone who's worked with a hundred has more potential cards in their deck that they can play if they're paying attention, uh, of, of what to do in a given, given situation. I'm like, Oh, I've had this happen before. What was the problem there? Oh yeah. That guy was not sleeping enough. Or I've had this problem before. What happened there? Yeah. He was telling me he was at RP seven, but when I saw his videos, he was almost always at RP 10. Okay. You know, so just in, all those different examples you, you can run into depending on uh, the kind of experience you have. So I think that's where. I want people's heads to get to when they start evaluating this stuff, you know, because programming is inherently a problem solving uh, process rather than a um, finding the right answer, you know, process. Yeah, and I think when you're in those early stages as well is that there's so many problems to cross, like there's so many rivers to cross because there's so many avenues you've yet to explore that you haven't built up patterns for that your body isn't even necessarily capable of actually performing at this given stage, which is why I think it's it's so difficult as well because there's, there's so much content that's out there in the world that it's, you know, top three tips to maximize strength for, for this for that for this for that try west side try this try that is that people that when they first come into the game is that they go online and that everyone does the you know how to get strong you have like 50 mm -hmm. billion articles in google in like less than a millisecond and you're like okay well what where do i start how do i know what's right and again i want to try and play a little bit of devil's advocate here uh if you are going into training is it just a case of that you actually just need to experience a little bit of everything before your body can tell you what it requires more of and what it requires less of? I would say that's actually something that might be more true at uh, once you're beyond the novice stage. So there's been a number of studies where uh, they've tried to create, based on some demographic factors that we know are linked to individuality, uh, individualized programs for beginners uh, and then a stock standard program and they don't outperform the stock standard program now this is not to say that individual differences don't exist it's more so to say that anything in the realm of decent for a complete novice is going to produce almost maximal gains you know so when, when you so long as you have progressive overload you're training the movements you want to get stronger on and you're somewhere in the realm of reasonable for volume intensity and frequency um, you're probably going to max out your strength potential over that initial three to six months. You know, um, I would say at that point, uh, that's where you might want to start getting a bit of a smorgasbord of, uh, of different experiences in the strength world and, and what, it, what it has to offer you. So long as it's still, in my opinion, within the realm of reasonable, it has to be relative um, to the given and sport. That course. means. Right. Yeah. You know, and um, and I think it's also important to remember that, that 
that, that giving something a good college try is may or may not align with your uh, like attention span, right? So if you're someone who gets excited every week over a new program and you're switching, that's not exactly what I'm saying. I'm saying, uh, you know, let something run its course for a, multiple mesocycles. You know, run something for eight to twelve weeks, uh, unless it's like going terribly within week four or something like that. It's clearly not not appropriate. Um, and then you, you, you go to the next thing to see how it goes. Uh, but also take note of where you were versus where you're going. Uh, and you also primarily, you, you need to be building some knowledge during this. And I don't I mean, you don't need to get like a degree in strength conditioning or anything like that. But you need to be able to assess a program for its big picture component parts and reverse engineer it. So what is the, the frequency of the main lift training? What is the total number of sets I'm doing? How close am I to failure? And then what is the, uh, so basically volume, intensity, and frequency of this program. What is it? And you can get a rough idea of it. Because if you were to go to something that doubles or triples or does one half or one third of what you were doing that was working, there's a good chance you're going to be overreaching unnecessarily and detrimentally or on under training to the point where you might get gains the first week as it's like a taper-like effect. You might actually regret. What you try um, needs to be evaluated to some degree based on where you were, uh, and you know, in in the realm of what could be optimal, you know, like ten plus sets per movement. That's a lot, you know. A pro, if you go from ten to thirty, those are both ten plus, but one is three times the volume of the other, and that might be a really good thing. Like if you just happen to have a very high capacity for training, you're perfectly built biomechanically to do the main lifts, and you were really just doing kind of the minimum of effective amount previously yeah going to 30 might be great for you that's not going to be normal but for most people going from 10 to 30 would be a recipe for getting crushed demotivated and possibly injured so i think you need to be aware of when you're you know comparing programs i remember back in the day people just used to they get frustrated with their progress and they go i'm going to try small off without any of awareness of, of what small has asked them to do there's a day in small over you do 10 by 3 at uh at i think like 85 percent or something like that there's people who only did 10 sets of squats in their previous program. That's a single day, you know? So um, not actually conceiving of that, of going, oh, wow, that, that's actually one of my, my four or five days per week of squats is more volume than I was doing in my entire previous program. Like you wouldn't want to go from five, three, one to small of. That would really not prepare you for the latter, you know? So that, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, you have to have some awareness as you're trialing these different things. So I agree with you. From your devil's advocate standpoint, there is a time and a place for trying different approaches. And it's probably kind of like that early stage intermediate, but it needs to come with some awareness of, of what you're trying. And because you don't want to just be like, oh, this program worked for me. Because if you just see programs as things rather than names for their component parts, uh, then you're not going to learn much from that process. Yeah. And like you said, you're going to be drawing new experiences from each time you're doing those lifts that actually the the way that you're loading or the volume or the intensity that it puts through your body is going to ref, is going to force different responses from your body because that's just what we do. You know, we're reactive beings. If we want to, you know, get better, then we have to adapt. And thankfully, being a human being, we're pretty bloody good at doing that if we're given all of the right tools so let's hop off and talk about that that subject for a minute because i'm very interested to see where you're at from um from a recovery standpoint we see so many different things that are, are out in the market and topics that people are talking about that have been deemed completely redundant where do you stand with recovery what are you recommending what are some of the things that you know, that people believe they should be doing, but scientifically is not providing any back, like, um, evidence to, to actually support that case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that the first place to start with recovery is um, understanding it as just kind of your natural uh, adaptive process. Um, so that any well built in program has some assumptions about recovery embedded in it, you know, or you would just train every waking hour, right? Um, if we didn't need to recover, if there was no fatigue and fitness response to training, it was just fitness. You just train every, every waking hour you had and maybe not go to sleep. Cause why am I sleeping? I don't need to recover. It's not a thing. So every program that's, that's written 
has kind of some inherent assumptions about the recovery capacity of the person doing it. And that's normally going to be based on the observations of the person doing it, maybe what weight class they came from, who they worked with, uh, whether they largely worked with enhanced lifters or not, uh, whether they they worked with really genetic li genetically gifted lifters, you know, whether they came from the Eastern blocks by the time, if this is a national coach, by the time someone's working with them, I mean, they've already shown themselves to be highly capable and they've gone through these volume progressions over time. Uh, whether they're, you know, an online coach who has a certain persona, so they only attract people who are, you know, of a hard hardcore mentality or something else. Uh, all of the assumptions of the program writer is going to result in a given amount of volume that seems appropriate for their experiences, uh, which has to do with the average recovery capacity of the person. Um, now that said, uh, if you are able to enhance the recovery side of your individual uh, abilities, I guess you could say, therefore, theoretically, you should be able to handle more volume and potentially have it be beneficial. Um, now, obviously, this is there's some finite limit to this. Um, you know, the old adage, of there's no such thing as under recovery there's just under eating i think is only true to a very limited degree um you probably if you eat so much that it actually becomes stressful that's probably inhibiting your ability to to, to, to recover and you're just getting out of shape having poor sleep and occasionally having diarrhea like that's not helpful you know so um yeah but certainly certain certain aspects of your just general habits are going to have the largest impact on recovery so before someone starts talking about like foam rolling or ice bath uh, I want to make sure that they're actually maybe, if they're going to be training hard and trying to do everything they can to maximize strength, uh, close to a calorie surplus, if not, at least not in a deficit. I'd like to see them um, sleeping, you know, seven to nine hours, hours a night or longer, if thinking about where can I sneak in naps. Uh, I'd like to see to make sure that they're actually consuming sufficient protein, uh, sufficient carbohydrate for whatever their training volume is. Uh, they don't have some kind of wacky breakdown of macronutrients that's not supportive of their training, uh, that they have adequate fruits and vegetables, that they have a reasonable level of activity, not like 10,000 steps, but like at least you know, five to seven per day, um, or just to some kind of reasonable level of activity. It's not steps, it could be something else. Uh, that they have decent stress management in the, the emotional and societal context. You know, Do they have a, a support network? Do they have, if they're working with a coach, is it a coach who they have a good relationship with, who believes in them, who they can talk to who gives that kind of positive expectation and can answer questions and, and give them be kind of their safety blanket when they are stressed and, and, and unsure of things. Uh, and then, you know, some, some basic supplementation, like are you taking creatine, you know, that, that, that can definitely make a positive impact. Um, so all of those things I, I would put in place things that we've known for years before I look at say massage, uh, or self massage like foam rolling or, or something like that. So when you look at, so that, that's, 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 that's kind of your, your baseline lifestyle, the environment for that strength farming I was kind of describing before. Now there's kind of like recovery modalities, which are interventions, you know, which are cool, uh, because they're fun. They're neat. There are things you can do to, to, to have an add on effect, uh, to your, you know, your, your recovery capacity. Uh, but, they have, like you said, there's there's multiple categories. There's some that people do that really have no positive effect except for possibly placebo. Uh, there are some that might have an acutely positive effect, but chronically might be a problem long term. And then there's some that have a solid evidence basis. So, for example, uh, cryotherapy, ice baths, etc. Um, they put your body in a state of acute recovery to where you might perform better sooner. However, we see long term they actually blunt some anabolic signaling and might impede strength and hypertrophy um, because they're circumventing that natural inflammation process. So they might make you better able to handle uh, training again acutely. So you might want to use them when you're a week out from a meet, but not any other time. Um, and then we have to ask ourselves, well, compared to what is an ice bath better? And there's some studies that would suggest that simply doing you know, low intensity cycling for 10 to 15 minutes after a lower body session I uh, might provide the same level of recovery as uh, as an ice bath so do I really want to fill my 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 tub with ice and get in it and be incredibly uncomfortable when I could just hop on a, a bike for 10 minutes and scroll on Instagram um, so I guess it depends on who you follow on Instagram but uh, so so that that's kind of the perspective you want to have right um, and there's actually good data showing that getting post training massages has a, has a pretty beneficial effect on uh, you know, muscle damage recovery happening earlier and being able to to perform a little better. And there's probably no negative downside of that. Same thing with uh, compression garments. So those are kind of in that category of why not. Um, and then things like cryotherapy are conditional. Uh, things like active 
recovery afterwards are also probably conditional. You want to make sure, like, if you're already really, really highly active, you did a really damaging session, like, yeah, act, that active recovery needs to be quite low stimulus, you know. It really just needs to be about getting some more or more, more blood turnover and, and movement. So I think it's very it's very dependent on, on what the actual intervention is. And uh, right now I would say uh, massage is, is a clear winner. Uh, cryotherapy, not done chronically. Uh, and then low intensity, 10 to 15 minute, like cycling or, or, or cardio. Uh, we're talking really, really low, like two out of 10 RPE kind of thing uh, for 10 to 15 minutes post training. Uh, those are all things that I, I would, I would say, yeah, I guess, you know, if I said compression garments, those as well, yeah. the things that have been backed in the research is potentially being uh, helpful without a downside. A hundred percent. So with everything that you've said there, like, I think it's fantastic that like you really emphasize the point that the, the first half of that, that question you were kind of talking about, it's just lifestyle. And I, I completely agree with you there. Mm. I, I think that it's, that's very much when you live and breathe training as much as we do, you understand that it's just part of the necessities that you have to do in order to allow your body to keep on progressing the way it is. That I love the way that you phrase it like the iron farm because it's it's so true. You know, if you clock in and clock out every day and you do the things that you need to do, you, yeah, you're going to get a plentiful crop at the end of the harvest, but you've got to put in all those things and you've got to make sure that you keep the pesticide on there to make sure that nothing else encroaches on those gains. And how much... Unless you're natty, then you don't use pesticides. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so, like, the, the, the lifestyle is a collective group of re recovery options. So let's talk about uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced now. Uh, so for a beginner, lifestyle, we're saying, is, is pretty much the, the, the be-all and end-all. That's really what you need to be doing. When you get through to the intermediate stages... If you're coming into kind of those uh, more acute problems, then there might be a few interventions that you can use there to help. And then at the advanced levels, obviously, when you're at that stage, those interventions, we're talking like not even necessarily like one to two percent differences in performance, are we? Like it's so minimal when you're getting up to, 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 to that stage that it's a case of the, the guys at the top do it because they need that one percent, they need that two percent. But then talking about what you're saying about Instagram, people are sat there scrolling going, oh, okay, so Andy Bowen's getting some acupuncture done on his hamstrings. Maybe that's what I'm missing from, from my training. Like, I need to get some acupuncture done on my hand. And it's like, no. Because if you're at the top level, then you need that 1%. But right now, you just need to stop smoking, sleep better, stop putting crap in your face, and actually hydrate. Yeah, I think a, a good way to look at this is it may not be that what the advanced people are doing is what's needed. It's that they've already exhausted everything. Like a really good example is every Olympic cycle, you will see some recovery modality that is that most people are doing. I remember a couple Olympic cycles back, everyone had kinesio tape all over their bodies. And this last Olympics, everyone had looked like they got attacked by an octopus. They had these, you know, the, the, the cupping all over their bodies. Um and then, you know, cryotherapy was really big when, when, when a couple of prominent basketball players mentioned it. Um, I think it's really important to understand that at that level, the vast majority of these athletes are sleeping well. They are getting their nutrition sorted. They have a nutrition. They might even have a fucking chef. Pardon my language. Um, they're going to have a, a masseuse. They're going to have a doctor checking their bloods. They're going to be taking a tailored supplement program. They're going to have a, a high-level S&C coach. Um, they've already maximized every variable. So, so them trying on these new things is because they're trying to compete against other people who are already doing that. And they're trying to break literally world records. They're, they're kind of reached that pinnacle. So the likelihood that you following that person on Instagram, along with a million other people has, has got all those things maximum is probably low. Uh, and the likelihood that the thing they're trying this time might not, you know, provide any benefit. It's actually pretty high, you know, uh, because they're running out of options. They're running out of things that they can do. They're trying things. Um, and so I, I think it's really useful to remind yourself that unless you have it as dialed in as an Olympic athlete does, uh, the lowest hanging fruit, and not only the lowest hanging easiest, you know, path of least resistance, but the thing that's going to be the biggest bang for your buck is emphasizing those lifestyle factors. 
So, you know, if, and, and Hey, if you're listening and you happen to be an Olympic caliber athlete or a world-class competitor and you're not sleeping more than six hours a night, man, imagine what would happen if you could actually get a few more hours of sleep. Maybe you'd be that much better, uh, rather than thinking about, like you said, acupuncture or something, something that that's a lot less proven and a lot less consistent and has a lot less data behind it. So it doesn't even have much to do with what the level of the lifter is. Uh, it has much more to do with there are some things that are going to have a really large impact and some things that may or may not have an impact and some things that have an impact but have a cost. And you don't want to start looking in those last two categories until you've maximized all the things that we know are just kind of your stock standard, get, get it done, part of your life. So hydration, fruits and vegetables, protein, enough calories, enough sleep, uh, and then managing your stress levels. So that might be meditation, a gratitude journal, and then getting coaches and a support staff in place and having all those things in place before you start thinking about, you know, cryotherapy or compression garments or masseuse or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I recently just started getting regular massages, but that's because I finally got all my other shit in order. You know, I, I, I made sure I, I had, had a way to get my fruits and vegetables in uh, and sorted. I've done a lot to improve my sleep and get my step count up so that I'm not sedentary and I'm not underslept. And then I was like, you know, what else can I do? Uh, I can get some regular massages. And then my, my brain then starts to go, what are the next things that are evidence-based that I could do? You know, actually stretching on my off days, there's some in, there's some there's some data that could show that might influence the uh, stretch shortening cycle strength performance and the might even aid hypertrophy sliding because it's a tension stimulus. That's something I could do when I'm, uh, you know, sitting there Netflixing and chilling with my wife. Why not do 10 minutes of stretching? But those are things that I think – the way our brains work, um, you need to have the bandwidth to do things and to have the mental bandwidth to do things. Other things that you're doing need to become habits because then they no longer require a choice or actionable thought. So me getting my steps in or getting my fruits and vegetables and my protein or appropriate calorie intake or sleeping and tracking on Fitbit and seeing how I'm doing and making adjustments, those are now habituated, you know, and I have a regularly scheduled massage every week now. Um, those are things that are now, they're off my list of, man, I really need to be doing this or I need to have it on my next thing up. But stretching, for example, uh, is not something I've yet habituated to. But once I have, then I'll be on to the next, but not until I have. Uh, because when you try to take the shotgun approach, you're basically gonna do like 10 things that are potentially helpful poorly and get nothing out of it. But if you can hone in on just one or two things and make them become consistent habits, then you'll actually reap those benefits and you can move on to the next. So it's kind of this ever evolving refinement process. And, you know, when you see, like you said, a high level power for getting acupuncture, they may, may be running out of options that they know potentially work. Uh, so that's probably not what you want to emulate, but rather start at the, the beginning of the, uh, the map. Yeah. A hundred percent. It makes total sense there. Like you, you have to be smart about these things and you have to look at where you are in regards to, to, to the grand scheme of things. And if you aren't ticking off those things that we mentioned our lifestyle things that that, realistically needs to be the priority of a, over all those other things because that's that's going to be the thing that gives you the most bang for your buck and it's really interesting that you're saying there like you haven't habituated to it yet and it's kind of <clears throat> i think a lot of people who uh you know are, are strength athletes who work in this environment who work in this industry habituate to so many of those factors that we just they're almost like non-negotiables in our lives you know, we know mm -hmm. that our food is on point. We know that our hydration is on point. We're getting in like three or four liters a day. We're making sure that our steps are up. But for so many people, they don't realize that these things are happening. And especially when you see people on uh, on Instagram and stuff, you know, you're talking about Kobe Bryant isn't sat there saying, well, actually, I had a really splendid nine hours of sleep last night and I was woken up to it's He's, he's talking about he's going to see this guy about this new therapy, about that, that's cool and interesting. He's not talking about all of the basic shit that is just his non-negotiable lifestyle. And realistically, I think a lot more people need to be paying attention to the fact that those guys aren't talking about these basic things because they are so basic. It's not sexy. It's not cool. It's not different. But it gets you the results that you need. So more people need to be doing yeah. that. It also just comes down to attentional bias, right? Um, we associate the changes we see, we draw patterns only with the variables we're paying attention to. 
So, you know, the classic example I like to give when I, when I lecture about supplements is I can't tell you how many times someone's come up to me and said, Hey man, I'm making really great gains off X supplement. And I ask him, well, what else are you doing? Well, I started this new program and you know, I, I, I also got on my eating plan. Like we tend to do things in, in chunks like, Oh, I want to get huge. I'm going to do all this stuff. But the thing you're paying attention to might be the supplement. And that's what you associate your gains with, you know? So now you had a great experience with XYZ supplement, but you forgot that you also upped your frequency, you're training harder, you're motivated, uh, and you're, you're eating. It's like, I actually think it's causing the gains. It's probably you eating more and training hard, not the random supplement you got from GNC, but that's what you're focused on. So Kobe Bryant, like you said, you know, some nutritionist hands him a post-workout shake with, with you know, a scoop and a half away, uh, gives him Gatorade during his tra training, uh, and he gets, you know, creatine, beta alanine. Uh, he goes, you know, gets sports massage, all this stuff. But he's thinking about, oh, the new thing we're doing right now is cryotherapy. I'm focusing on that. And if I had some good progress, that's what I'm going to associate it with. Um, so I think it's really important to, to remember that there's a lot of variables going on in the background. And just because you're focused on one of them doesn't mean it's the thing that's actually doing that. That's why in science, uh, we have to actually set up these randomized controlled trials where everything is the same except for the one variable that's different. And then just because we can't know all the variables that might go into it, we have to get a large enough sample size so that we know that any random effects of stuff going on, like if I just took two random people off the street, gave them the same nutrition, the same training, but one did better, how do I know one's not sleeping longer than the other? You know, it might not be the, the thing I'm studying that caused the effect. So I've got to get at least 30 people in each group so that I know that any random sleeping patterns in one group should be washed out by the random sleeping patterns in the other so we can drill down to just the effect of that one uh, variable that we're manipulating. And then guess what? I needed actually five more really confident that's the case and ideally a meta-analysis. So that that's kind of the degree to which uh, we can really have confidence in things needs that kind of control. We rarely have that. And when we do have it, it's for those big picture variables. Like I can give you, yeah, 10 plus sets and train each lift at least twice per week. Um, and you probably want to train, you know, your lifts over 80% of 1RM most of the time. Uh, and you probably don't want to go to failure on your main lifts every time you train. Beyond that, there's a lot of wiggle room, you know? And that's when we have these lower quality evidence things that we, we, we can base things on. And we have to kind of use that case study of one model and create those patterns. So yeah, and that, that goes for recovery, that goes for training, that goes for nutrition, unfortunately. Yeah, that it's it's a big old minefield that that we've got to kind of operate out of there, and I think we're we're incredibly thankful to have people like yourself that is kind of showing us that you know these are the facts, these are the figures. If you want to achieve these things, then this is what you have to do. You know, there there is no way around it. It's not anecdotal. This is the true science. And for someone like myself, that's very much what I've always believed in. I always find science incredibly fascinating. So to read up on new studies coming out all the time that you guys are doing is is it's amazing and you know we're at a point uh in our age where we have access to to so much and ever more information is coming our way which is just allowing us to make even more better um uh choices within our training within our nutrition it's becoming a bigger minefield but we're also learning how to navigate through that minefield a little bit better as well I think it's just a big general learning process for well, pretty much everyone in the industry. I would agree. And you know, a big, a big part of focus of my career has been to get away from saying, hey, uh, science equals better uh, than what you were doing before, but more so, and uh, don't let science become your religion. Uh, understand the limitations of science and when to use experience, when to use trial and error. And also with all of this, this ever increasing minefield as you put it, which I think is a good description, we need to not just build our collection of knowledge, but also the engine behind it and our ability to critically think and assess this so that it doesn't just become, it depends cop out. It depends as a, a death knell. You know, when you hear it depends, it's like, fuck, well, I guess it's another thing I won't know the answer to, but rather, what does it depend on and getting more tools as you said so i think you put that well uh that we can understand that, that science is not the new guru rather uh science is a different way of thinking and, and the ability for us to have more options and then assess which one of those options might be the most likely and highly probable solution to a given uh issue and then when it doesn't work that's fine 
I've got more options because there's more research out there. Um, so that's the goal. Slow, continual process, but yeah. Exactly. That's always the goal. Now, I always like to close off the podcast with, with asking a question. It's quite a deep question, um, and it's going to be very interesting to see what, what you say for, for a man of science. Uh, everyone's perspectives is different, but I want you to imagine that you're taking a, a trip back in time uh, to visit your younger self, okay? You're kind of 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, okay? Very, very influential at that age. You are allowed to give uh, one parting gift of knowledge, wisdom, whatever it might be, quote, uh, a way to live your life to get you from where you are at that age to where you are today with everything that you know. What core information are you passing on to that young man that's going to help him to get through to, to, to the success that you've had today? I would probably tell myself to stick with something uh, until... I saw my, my full capacity in. Uh, when I was a young man, I used to be a, f I used to want things to come easy to prove that I had a natural gift because that's what I thought was good. Um, and if I was to, didn't want to try hard because if I failed, I'd have a cop out. You know, I'd be like, well, of course I was an elite performer. I didn't try very hard. You know, kind of the the Vince Vaughn dodgeball uh, approach to life. And, um, you know, I was the type of guy who would, I would test to get into an advanced placement class, but then get a B, uh, because it would give me equivalent GPA to an A in a normal class. So I think that wasn't necessarily just laziness. So that was part of it. Uh, a big part of that was one to maintain the safe belief that I was special, uh, because I could get by without putting much effort. But if I did put in a lot of effort and I proved to be not acceptable, I mean, I wasn't special. And then do, do I have value? Do I have worth? And to try to express to myself that, hey, you have intrinsic value, you have intrinsic worth, and it's okay to not be exceptional at something you try. But it's much more commendable and impressive, and uh, you learn so much more by putting in full effort into something regardless of where you get and emphasizing more the, uh, the journey, if you will. Yeah. So that would have been my lesson to myself that I've only learned now in my 30s. So. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. That's absolutely brilliant. Listen, thank you so much for coming on board, Eric. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure we'll be back at some point because I still have like 20 different questions uh, that I haven't even touched on yet. Um, I'm going to pick your brain so much more. Um, thank you very much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me and I would definitely be honored to come back. Thank you.